That always surprises me. All right, uh, Christina, Mary Beth, are you seeing the presentation screen? Yes, we are. Or I am. Let me go back. Throw a little forward. Okay, perfect. And then Mary Beth, when I just do this part, if you can monitor some of the people in the waiting room, are you seeing them come through? Yep. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, this is our first elementary specific uh, parent education, family education night of the year. We're so happy to have you here. Um, we're probably going to present for about an hour today, um, and we'll definitely have some space for question and answers. You can also feel free to put questions in the chat as well, and I will be monitoring that. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Megan Hubbard. I'm the head of school at the Brookland campus, and I am joined tonight by two of our elementary guides that I'll let them introduce themselves real quick. Mary Beth, if you want to start. Hi, I'm Mary Beth Washington. I am the upper elementary guide at our Brookland campus in the Sequoia community. <laughs> as well as being our elementary coach, <laughs> dual role. And then Christina, if you wanna go ahead. Sure, I'm Christina Blomberg. I am a lower L guide at the Brookland campus in the Ginkgo community. Great, thanks. Um, so as before we start, we will um, do the land acknowledgement that is part of our um, processes at Lee Montessori. We, the community of Lee Montessori, honor the original protectors of the lands that we now call Washington, D.C. D.C. sits on the ancestral lands of the Anacostans, also documented as the Natchoctank, and over time neighboring the Piscataway and Pamunkey peoples. Now let's give a brief, respectful and brief moment of silence. All right, this evening, our topic is building independence and community. And I'm about to turn it over to Mary Beth and to Christina. But before we do that, I wanna do a quick little, we have a very small group, so an intimate icebreaker. But we're talking about community and we're talking about the social lives of children tonight. And I want you to think for a moment and feel free to just put it in the chat. In what ways can you see that your so like you as a social being's life has been impacted or changed since the pandemic not your children not school but what has really changed for you as an individual Yeah, so these, I think this is, you know, we're changing our definitions of what working is. People are working at home, um, less time for social life, um, not being able to hug people in person, um, valuing at home time more than you might have before, not having friends over for dinner, more downtime. Um, I shared that I find myself like as someone who used to not spend a lot of time at home, like anxious to get back to my house if I've been out for an evening, um, which is not something I ever really experienced before. Feel free to keep them coming if you want while we talk about this, but um, just wanted to highlight that in this time, um, you know, this 18 months time period, the way that we interact with each other has changed. Um, some things about ourselves have changed. 
um, and things about your children and how they interact and uh, are in a social environment at school have changed as well. So we really tonight want to focus on kind of bringing back to the core of what we do in Montessori and how we're building independence and then move a little more to talk about what the social community is like as well and what we're striving um, to create. So I will go ahead and put myself on mute and pass it on to our presenters. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Megan. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to make this a part of your evening. Um, and Megan, actually, if you can go back to our just our first slide there, the building independence and community. Um, when we take a look at those pictures, we see students doing things for themselves, doing things, doing work with each other. Um, and, you know, th this is the elementary, right? We're working uh, for our community and we're working uh, with each other all the time. Each stage of growth contributes a portion of development by means of independence. And in the second plane of development, the independence that is met is to take care of more than physical needs. There's being active, there's nutrition and our biological development, but there's also intellectual development and moral development and the social skills that go with those. Uh, so we give the child exposure to intellectual stimulus during this plane, and we continue the work that's happened in primary. All right, so moving on to the next slide, our agenda. Um, this is the walk we're going to take together tonight. Uh, we'll talk about just being present with what is right now, how, the way the world is right now. Um, we'll do a little bit of Montessori background. So um, just some words that we have in uh, Montessori theory. Then we'll talk about different kinds of independence that we see in the classroom, personal independence, social independence, and work independence or intellectual independence. All right, next slide. Um, there is an article that I was reading recently uh, by Letty Rising, um, who the author of this article, Rebuilding the Elementary Environment During Late Stage Pandemic Times, which is a term that was a little new to me, late stage. Um, and it's a really interesting article and we can share it in the, share it in the chat, but one of the quotes that stuck out with, to me was this one, that major life occurrences are are not singular events, but are processes that take time. While we are in this delicate place of moving forward to where we want to be, it's time for everyone to offer grace, modify expectations, and be present with what is. Um, and the in the article, she talks about some of the research that and observations that teachers have been seeing and others have been seeing that. Um, you know, it, we're seeing that children just need more support right now. They need more support with their social skills. They need more support um, with kind of relearning how to navigate um, relationships. And so a big part of our work is supporting that. Um, next slide. So um, now we're gonna talk a little bit about one of these Montessori terms, self-construction. And um, it's a term that basically means the child is creating who they will, they will become as an adult. Dr. Montessori observed that children are immersed in this work and it's a creative process of figuring out who they will become. And um, Jamie Rue, who uh, was a trainer at WMI and does a lot of work in the Montessori community is going to tell us a little more about that. Let's see. All right, let me, I'll just go to the original link and do it. Give me one second.
Mary Beth, remember when you were so excited that you learned how to embed a video? <laughs> now I can't play it. That. <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't have sound the way it's embedded. Um, okay, let me try something else. wouldn't be a virtual experience without technical difficulties. No, this is part of our new social life. <laughs> things, things we've adjusted to. All right. This one is called, remind me, this is the. Self, should be self-construction. Oh, what is self-construction? Okay. Wow, that took me a long time to find quite um, a long bit of videos here. All right, thanks for bearing with us guys and I will get that up now. Dr. Montessori developed her approach through observation of children. She watched to see what children showed her at every stage of their development and then responded to those needs, to what they demonstrated would best serve their development. And this makes it a really unique approach to education because it's not something that was imposed upon the children, but actually emerged from what the children were showing Montessori. One of the big revolutionary things that Montessori uh, observed was that children are fundamentally different from adults. They aren't just adults in miniature, which society had sort of treated them for a very long time. Montessori saw that there are distinct characteristics throughout a child's development that need to be um, supported in different ways, uh, depending on the age of the child and what they need at that time. And she realized that at every stage of development, no matter what the age of a child, the child is really working to build themselves. They are self-constructing. That We outside of the child can support that, but the construction of self is happening inside the child and the child is doing it all the time. Montessori saw that we are wired to build ourselves from birth. That we, um, that we have to build ourselves adapted to our particular culture and location. We don't have uh, instincts and adaptations like animals to a specific environment in a specific place. We have to take that in from our surroundings and build ourselves to respond to that. So children are constantly self-constructing and adapting to their culture and their environment. And when Montessori started to respond to that, when she offered children exactly what they needed at a certain stage of their development, the impact was profound. Uh, people came to visit Montessori's classrooms uh, and were just amazed. The press hailed these children, these three to six year olds, who were working with concentration and quiet and focus, they hailed these children as new children. Now, Montessori said, you know, these aren't new children. This is just children who have developed and been supported in natural development. But she did realize that these new children, as they were called, needed new adults that could support their development. Montessori saw that to best support children's development, the new adults that are working with them can't be like a traditional teacher, just depositing information in a child's brain. That these new adults have to be ready to serve children's development, to serve the construction of themselves that they are doing. Uh, we, aren't, we aren't the know all in front of the classroom, but instead, the sort of collaborator in service of children's self-construction. And it's this idea that really is foundational for the rest of the work we do with children in a Montessori environment or the way we approach children. 
we have to constantly think about approaching children from the perspective that I am here to serve your self-construction that you are doing that work constantly, whether or not I support you. But in order for you to have optimal self-construction, I need to support you in specific ways. So we as adults have to consider ourselves more like scaffolding, right? That, that's there on a building that's under construction and only there uh, as long as it's needed to support the construction because scaffolding's ugly, <laughs> right? It's not meant to be on a building. And the same with the way we support children. We're not going to be there forever. That scaffolding we provide is there as long as the children need. We'll move it to another place as they don't need it one place anymore, or eventually, you know, as they mature into adulthood, it won't be needed anymore. That's our role as adults when we are supporting this self-construction. And this does have to be the way we approach children all the time with this idea that they are building themselves. We have to believe you know, wholeheartedly that they're doing that, that they can do it, that they'll do it no matter what, and that we have confidence in them doing that. And our job is to support that in, in the best possible way but we can't do that constructing for them. All right. So we're going to stop it right there and then talk to you guys a little bit of what now um, this construction looks like and what we help the children do in the environment. And I'll see if I can get back to our presentation. All right. Yes. Thank you. So um, Rising Tide Montessori, uh, her Jamie's website, there's a lot of videos there if you're interested in um, learning learning more about some of the theory and some of the application around what we're talking about. Um, so we're talking about how do we support independence in community? And so we're talking about how do we support that self-construction of a child into a social being in, in the elementary environment? Uh, we have to talk about something called freedom and responsibility when we talk about self-construction. It's a, a core element of how does the child function in a Montessori elementary environment. Um, now, Montessori's idea of freedom referred to an ability to make one's own choices, a little bit different than what we think, slightly different than what we think of when we hear freedom. And there's a focus on their ability, what kind of what skills they have to be able to have that, to be able to be free, to be able to make their own choices. When the child is able to make safe and pro-social choices um, that support their growth, they become independent or free from their impulses. So as elementary teachers, we're, we give them lots of opportunities for independence to develop and we support them as they need it. All right, next slide. So the first kind of independence we're going to focus on is um, practical independence, and that's uh, your personal independence. Um, and with that, we talk about the idea of the will. Um, now we think of willpower and kind of muscling through things, and or you know, that, well, if you're willful, that you're um, very eager to to do what you have in mind. Um, the will is in Montessori terms is kind of like their, it's also related to freedom, like their ability to, to express themselves and to do um, what they have in mind. Now the three-year-old, they're driven by impulses, whereas children in elementary start to respond to reason and think through their decisions. In the classroom environment, we avoid telling children what to do exactly because we want them to develop their own sense of which choices will serve them. So without the experience of their own decisions, and sometimes they find out, oh, that decision actually didn't serve me very well, um, the children will depend on adults for a validation of their choices and possibly struggle to try on their own. But we wanna support good decision-making uh, because by giving them opportunities to make decisions, we, we can inform them about those choices and then support positive choices. 
So we want the children to have lots of opportunities to express themselves and develop their will. And they need skills to do that successfully. So now we're on to a quote from Montessori. Individual freedom is the basis for all the rest. Without such freedom, it is impossible for personality to develop fully. Freedom is the key to the entire process. And the first step comes when the individual is capable of acting without help from others and becomes aware of himself as an autonomous being. Now, in the elementary community, children are learning how to spend their days together. And it is an environment of frequent collaboration. We often call it like a practice society. So independence here is can be understood more as independence from an adult telling them what to do. We don't necessarily want them working in isolation, right? We want them working together. All right, and now we're on to personal, let's see. Let me see. Oop, I think I, I might get a little confused with slide. Sorry, I skipped the slide on you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and then we have one more quote after this one. So next slide, there we go. Sorry, I got, got myself out of order. Um, there can be no manifestation of the will without completed action. He who thinks of performing a good action but leaves it undone he who desires to atone for an offense, but takes no steps to do so. He who proposes to go out to pay a call or to write a letter, but goes no farther than the matter does not accomplish an exercise of the will. To think and to wish is not enough. It's action that counts. So we're constantly looking to give the child opportunities to act and to make those good decisions. Um, or, you know, to find out, um, to find out about cause and effect. So we give students many opportunities to exercise this will and we support them as they need it. And now we're gonna look more concretely into what does that really look like? And with that, I pass the baton to Ms. Washington. Thanks. Um, and so independence, when we're talking about practical independence is really about the ability to carry out a choice. So in primary, often this looks like um, pouring activities, learning um, self-control, and the child gets a very clear feedback from the activity if beans spill all over the floor or the water um, splashes and spills. And in the elementary, we have similar experience for the children where they're watering plants, um, they use glass objects, so they learn how to, they have to handle certain material. Um, but this is also true in a social aspect too, where the children have an opportunity to interact with one another. And then the guide is also there to support and um, kind of coach them through when situations arise. And we're going to get deeper into that um, a little bit later in this presentation. Um, next slide, please. And so what does this practical independence look like at home? Um, kids can prepare their own lunch, help prep dinner. Um, some students, older students can even have a night where they cook dinner for the family. Now, whether that's macaroni and cheese or um, like packaged salad, it's not, that's not um, the importance, but the important piece of it is that the child is preparing something for the home community and thinking about the other people in the community as a whole and not just him or her, herself. Um, the student can set out their own clothes before school, make their bed, help with laundry, um, help with grocery lists, or even compare prices at the grocery store. Um, another task that an older student or an older child could do is read to a younger sibling. These are just some ideas. Um, I'm sure you and your children can also come up with many and um, implement some of those at home. Next slide, please. Now, often students don't know where to start. Independence can be this very big, overwhelming feeling. And so what we do as adults is we find ways to support this independence in the classroom 
And it's something that can also be done at home, um, like providing a checklist for different routines, timers to help manage their focus when brushing their teeth or getting ready in the morning, limiting options of books, clothes, or toys to help lessen this overwhelming feeling, giving children access to healthy snacks that are within their reach, not asking, not needing to ask an adult to help um, get some of those things if he or she is hungry. And um, having a family paper calendar so students can add to that calendar if they're having a play date or if they help organize and schedule a family outing like to a pumpkin patch or something. Um, so these, all these support and foster preparation for the children as future adults. And so now we just wanna take a moment in the next slide um, to just hear from you and hear what's on your mind and if you have any questions. You can feel free to come off mute if you're comfortable or you can put a question in the chat. All right, and we'll have a couple more pauses throughout the presentation. So if something does come up, please feel free to put it in the chat. And then during one of our next pauses, um, we can answer your question. And so Christina's gonna talk a little bit about social independence, how the children get their needs met yet still take care of others in the environment. All right, so social independence. How do, we, how do we get our own needs met and how do we still take care of others? So for many students, they spent 18 months uh, with fewer social interactions. Um, and so being suddenly in a community of 25 other people and navigating all of the hundreds of social interactions they're having all day long is a monumental task. Um, as children develop, they're, they're often able to follow directions given by adults, and Montessori called this a kind of obedience. Um, in the elementary community, we aim for children to go one step further and develop a sense of personal responsibility. In an environment in which children trust the adults and their peers, they feel connected to them, they will set aside choices that only serve themselves in order to do what's right for everyone. They also have a strong sense of justice that, and fairness that they know, ugh, that even though I really want something, it wouldn't be fair if I only had that thing and others didn't. So an example of this we often see in the classroom is a child volunteering to clear, clean up a mess that they didn't make we know that they feel connected to their community and they feel that sense of uh, social independence when they can, they're not so concerned that, well, I didn't make the mess, so I shouldn't have to clean it up. Um, another example is, um, you know, recently in our community, we, we noticed that some, some people were taking a lot of colored pencils to make a drawing and then others couldn't find any. And so at a community meeting, we um, discussed the issue and they voted, well, you know, even though we might individually want a lot of colored pencils for ourselves, we're going to decide that you can only take three at a time. And that way there should be enough for everyone. So it's important that children are encouraged to think critically about what is fair and right when following directions. So back to this idea of obedience, we don't want children children to just obey our directions. In other words, the teacher is not always right. <laughs> um, in our class, we, we rotate specials groups who sit on the carpet versus at the table so we can have a little bit more space to sit. And so we just use those special groups because they just splits the class in half. And if I forget or get it wrong about which group sits on the carpet on one day and which group sits at the table, they will let me know. And I'm so glad that they do. They don't just blindly follow my directions because 
I make mistakes, I forget things. So we want them to think, we want them to be speaking up and thinking critically about what they see is fair. Speaking up when some, they see something is fair happening can look like a child arguing with an adult. And we have to be so careful about how we respond. I want students to feel like they can speak up. So if I need to keep a decision that I've made that they're questioning, I'm gonna acknowledge how they're feeling and then I'm gonna give them my reason why. And, that, and it should be a reason that makes sense. All right, next slide. So in order for students to feel like they can set aside what they want to best serve their community, they have to feel connected to that community. And so we focus a lot on community building at the beginning of the year, but also throughout the year so that students have that sense of psychological safety. They know their classmates and they have the sense that they can depend on each other. We play a lot of games, we get to know each other, and we talk about community agreements, how we want our days to go and how we want to be treated. We make decisions together regularly by discussing issues and brainstorming solutions, and then we vote on those decisions. Um, and then we also talk a lot about just how to be with each other. Um, some examples of that from recent conversations where we had squeezy eggs going missing, but when you're frustrated, you could squeeze this egg and the group voted that they would ask to use one. They decided, well, we're not quite ready for all that, for the, for the freedom of having those all the time because we just keep losing them. Um, one of the other choices was, one of the other things that we voted on was that they were gonna build a wall around our cozy chair where the squeezy eggs are kept um, so that the, that the you know, eggs would not disappear. Um, but they just, they voted and decided, well, maybe that would be a little too much work. <laughs> so reasoning skills. All right, moving on to grace and courtesy. All right, so and we have- Beth, I'm gonna uh, pass the torch back to you. Thanks. <laughs> Am I off mute? Yeah, okay. Um, so in addition to the academic lessons that we present to students, we also have lessons that we call grace and courtesy. And that was present in the primary environment and it continues into the elementary environment. So some lessons and conversation that we have could be how do we carry a chair or how do I stand in line? Um, how do I ask for more space in line or on the carpet? How do I get someone's attention? How might I borrow a pencil or a pencil sharpener or tell someone that they're bothering me? And so we have these, we do these lessons sometimes in a big group if it's something that needs to be addressed with the whole community. And sometimes we might be doing them in small groups. So I mentioned earlier in this that we coach students by modeling and role-playing scenarios. So in individual live instances within the classroom, meaning something in the moment, we might walk over and guide students through an interaction by advising them on appropriate language if we see that a situation is not going very well or effectively. Um, so we will give them appropriate language for effectively communicating their points. When we do this as a whole class, the students will role play a confrontation and engage in a guided but student led debrief and analyze the given responses as a group to determine that if the interaction was beneficial for the larger community. And so students come up with very thoughtful analysis and we have some enriching conversations. Some things that could be done at home are talking about scenarios with students. Um, like what happens if somebody pushes you at recess? What do you do? Um, and then discussing some of the options that a student have or your child has, and sometimes even giving them the language of how they can assert themselves in a respectful manner. Um, some other conversation topics that you can have with your students in a more positive communication is asking your children, how did you help someone today? Or who did you enjoy talking to today? Um, and so you can frame them where you can support them when some 
when a social challenge occurs, but then also on the other side of it, like a proactive side, you're communicating that you value helping another person or um, the social interaction that your child might have with friends. Um, so pausing here, um, what type of questions, if you want to share in the chat, what type of questions um, do you like asking your child to learn about their day? And you can just kind of put them in the chat as they come to mind. Next slide. And so conflict resolution and restorative justice. We give children the language to hear each other's perspective and advocate for themselves and repair harm. So we will walk the students through acknowledging another person's viewpoint giving the other person space to share how he or she is feeling and their perspective of the situation. We will acknowledge their feelings and their perspective, and then the other person will have an opportunity to do the same. In regards to restorative justice, we emphasize the importance of fully making amends in a meaningful and impactful way. Not something like just saying sorry, because we know that we should apologize if we hurt somebody's feelings, but finding a meaningful way to, to show our empathy or to show that we are sorry. So it might be writing somebody a letter. It might be helping someone put together something that was destroyed or broken. Um, and again, these are, these are thought of by the children. And oftentimes it's a collaborative effort between the two who had a disagreement. And next slide. We just wanna take a moment and just check in with you and see if there are any questions um, that have come up so far. Um, just people shared things that they ask their children. What made you feel happy today? Did anything make you frustrated? How was school today? And leave it open to allow my child to share what's on their mind. How was your day? What did you learn? Tell me about your friends. Was it fun? Great, thanks. And I hope as these keep coming through the chat, you kind of build a, a toolbox of questions to ask your kids. Next slide. So we're gonna jump into work independence in the elementary classrooms. And this is both true for lower, all this is true for lower elementary and upper elementary. Um, so there are three different kind of works that we're going to tell you about. Um, we have, a, and I will define those in the next slide. There is follow-up work, ongoing work, and then big work. The tools that students use to support their work independence um, are knowledge of these three types of work, and as well as keeping a work journal. Um, this might look different for children of different ages, and the expectation might be different as the child gets older. We also have individual conferences with students to reflect on their work um, socially and intellectually. Students have folders of work that moves from an unfinished work folder into a work binder or portfolio. We have um, just the progression or structure of the material use supports work independence and then going out, which are like small group, like many little field trips that the children um, initiate and plan. Thanks, next slide. And so at the start of the day, students plan their intention for the work period. They typically will write down the date and lessons and projects that they intend to work on that day. Older students might write a reflection um, at the end of their day to see if they were able to accomplish what they set out to do. 
Oftentimes this is a place for them to also check into have this self-awareness of how their day was and how they're feeling. It's also a place for them to unload if they have any um, emotions or thoughts that are weighing on them. Next slide. And then here, getting back to the three kinds of work that I mentioned um, for the intellectual independence. So we have on the left, follow-up work, in the middle, ongoing work, and then to the right, big work. And so follow-up work on the left again is where students practice a new skill after a lesson. Ongoing work um, in the middle is a type of practice where foundational skills are expounded on. Um, and also I want to just rec I just want to acknowledge that the first picture is kind of a follow-up work because this was a first lesson that these children had with this material. Um, but it is also in fact ongoing work because they're working on multiplication. So just want to let you know that. Um, and then ongoing work where they are practicing these foundational skills continuously. And then on the right, big work is initiated by students' curiosity and their interest. Oftentimes it's displayed in these large objects like timelines or a lengthy math problem that go well beyond the scope of one work period. Next slide. And so just kind of giving you a little bit more insight in these three types of work. Um, this follow-up work, after I mentioned, after a lesson is given, students will brainstorm with the guide and each other or are given a task to continue practice of this skill independently or in a small group. So you'll see in this first picture here, there are three or four students working on um, seeing if they can make a scaling triangle with a right angle or seeing what types of triangles they can make and the type of interior angle that correlate to those types of triangles. So this is a follow-up work on a lesson on types of triangles. And then in the center here, you see students working independently, but uh, side by side in finding square roots of numbers of their choice. And then on the far right, you will see a student who is creatively following up on a lesson on the Pythagorean theorem, where a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Next slide. And now we have some ongoing practice. And again, this is when the student builds on a foundational skill. So we give students the tools to set goals and accomplish them at their own pace. So the child picture in the center here, he is working on his multiplication facts. Um, these are in order. So he has, he can skip count. He can write the multiplication fact if he knows it. Um, and so that's him practicing this ongoing skill. He also has a paper in his portfolio that is helping him track what skill he knows and what skills he still has to learn in order to know what is considered him understanding multiplication. Um, and then we have other ways to track skills in the classroom too, like students racing to see when they can learn their four facts and five facts and um, so forth, but them keeping track of it and taking ownership over, um, their learning. Next slide. And then big work. Um, oftentimes, as I mentioned, these are division problems that go from one end to the room, one end of the room to the other. Here, students on the left are making a timeline of historical events of a war. This took place over several days. The students first researched the war and its cause. They identified major events throughout the war and deemed which were relevant to its progression. Then 
and they drew pictures to represent these events in chronological order. And finally, they practiced oral presentations to one another and then to the guide. And then in small groups, they presented this to students who were interested in their project. The students on the right, their work looks a little bit different, however, it is really great and big work. Um, they are harnessing a need for movement. These boys on the picture on the right are testing a, hypo a hypothesis about three different physical exercises, tracking their progress in speed over a four day trial period. Next slide. And then this is their work for folders and portfolios. And so, as I mentioned, this ongoing work or follow-up work, work can move from an unfinished work folder to a finished work binder or portfolio. And these portfolios can be used in student-led conferences or as a place for students to gather work that they deem exceptional, things that they're really proud of. Christina, do you want to add anything? I don't think so, not, not yet. Thank you. All right, and actually, Christina, um, if you would like to talk about structure of material use. Absolutely. All right, so structure of material use. Uh, there is a kind of a hidden structure to even just the child looking around the room and looking at the shelves to decide what to do. So we have expectations um, that, you know, a child waits for a lesson before they use a material. So if they're really interested in a material, they can ask for that lesson. Uh, and often it means, well, we need to practice what comes before that. So let's talk about a plan of what other lessons you'll need before you get this one that you really want. And it creates this sense of interest and, and anticipation and motivation to um, come back and find, okay, all right, well, if I want this one that I really want, I have to go practice these and then we'll find out what's next. And it creates an internal motivation uh, for them to practice lessons they've been given. All right, next slide. So going outs, uh, Mary Beth mentioned those and going outs are kind of a culmination of so many different skills. They have to be practically independent. They need to be able to tie their shoes if they're out and about. They need to be able to manage their own body and regulate their emotions. They need social independence. They need to be able to work as a team to navigate where they're going. In a going out, um, a child, there's a couple different kinds, but they will, for instance, have researched um, trilobites, um, an ancient creature on the timeline of life. And they might decide, okay, well, I really need to find out more because we just don't have enough books in the classroom on trilobites, Miss Blomberg. So um, they will then decide, okay, we're going to go to the Natural History Museum. And they've written some research and they have some more questions that they need to answer or that they want to answer. And so then we start talking about, well, what, how do we, how are you going to get to the Natural History Museum? So they will, um, in our class, we look at Google Maps and they'll write out the directions to the Natural History Museum to get on the metro. Um, they'll make themselves a map. And then we'll have some conversations about how to be safe on the metro. And they are chaperoned by an adult for um, to make sure that everything is safe. Uh, but it is the children who are leading this experience. And it is an experience to do research. So all of these skills from their academic skills, their social teamwork skills, like what if people have two different ideas about which what the directions actually say? How are they going to decide which way to go? You know, how, how do we make sure we get back to school at the time we need to? Sometimes it takes a little longer than they expect. Sometimes they find themselves walking in circles. Almost all the time they actually get where they plan to go, <laughs> but not always. Um, there are 
other kinds of going outs where they might uh, go do a community service project. Um, sometimes it's cleaning up an area, but sometimes they might be um, visiting, um, could be senior citizens. I've heard of other classrooms who had a regular going out to go spend time with senior citizens. Now, in, in our times, that's not so possible right now, but the idea being that there's more than one reason that we go on a going out. Sometimes it's even just to collect materials for a particular project that they're planning. Um, so students are empowered to find the answers to their own questions with materials and resources in the prepared environment. And this frees them from being dependent on an adult to provide them with all the knowledge. And when groups are driven to explore a topic beyond the walls of the classroom, then they have this opportunity to go and practice skills that they're learning in this practice society in the real world. So when we circle back to this idea of self-construction, this is such an empowering experience for them to say, yes, I can do this with independence successfully. Just the, the looks on their faces when they finally arrive at the museum, even if it took them over an hour to get there is huge because they got themselves there. All right, next slide. So ways you can support going out at home, even though there's um, a, a different, it's a different level of independence because they're with family, they can still participate. They, you might have conversations at home about how they can independently ask for what they like at a restaurant or how, who they can talk to at the library to look for books they're interested in. Um, Children in the elementary are capable of planning snacks for car trips, choosing games to bring, planning ahead for how they will occupy their spare time. And they can look at maps and start getting an idea of, well, you know, often we're using uh, Google Maps or, or, you know, some form of GPS to get us where we're going, but having actual maps around so they can feel oriented um, is, is a wonderful opportunity. Um, they can also just get to know if your family's going somewhere and will be staying overnight. Maybe they'd like to know what's in the area and different, different choices that there are, even you know, if those aren't all options for that particular trip. All right, so that's going out. Um, another tool of independence is individual conferences. So regularly, um, Guides will meet with each student to check in and talk about how things are going. Um, the child will bring their journal and um, we like to make it special. So for in my class, I have a pencil with rainbow lead um, and they get to um, decorate their checking goal um, with, the, with the rainbow pencil. Um, so we talk with students about what's going well for them with their work and what's hard um, so that it encourages them to reflect on um, the choices that they're making, but also just you know things that they might need some support with. Um, I usually ask my students also, what would they like help from me with? Um, what lessons they're requesting? And um, then just anything else on their mind. Sometimes it's a social issue that they like some support with. So it really can be a holistic check-in. It's not just about you know, what are you working on? Um, and then often we set a goal and we talk about, okay, what's your first step to reach your goal? Um, and it's really neat to hear what they have on their mind. Often it's something that surprises me. All right. Um, Mary Beth, I think I took your slide. Did you, <laughs> did you want to add to that? That's okay. You captured all of it. <laughs> all right. Uh, but we can go ahead to the next slide. And so, all these independent social and work practices cultivate a sense of personal accountability and responsibility. We want the children to leave the elementary environment with confidence in the skills that they need to be successful in their next environment, whether that be upper elementary or even into adolescence. And so, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I guess I was like, I da da that, but um, yeah, all these things lead up to that. And that is our hope. Absolutely. All right, we have one last final slide here. 
Um, and this is just another resource for uh, language that um, really just supports parents. It's um, it's an account on Instagram. They also have, they're on Patreon um, called Curious Parenting, and um, there there's just a lot of ways of phrasing questions we have for children or ways of um, just kind of supporting you know positive ideas of boundary setting that. Um, I personally have found really useful and um, maybe you'd like to check it out. And after that, we again would love to know what's on your mind, what's resonating with you. It doesn't necessarily have to be a question, but um, what what is something that could be like a, a light bulb moment or something that you'd like to know more about? Uh, if you want to put questions in the chat, or I don't know how big our group is, if it's okay to just come off mute. What do you think, Ms. Hubbard? Oh yeah, people can definitely come off mute if they have questions to ask, and then I will also read any questions out loud if you can't see the chat too. And I think we got to everything. Um, Tracy did ask if we could share the conversation prompts, which we will. I know Primary also puts together a list of like, here are some good questions to ask when you're actually trying to get question <laughs> information from your children, which honestly is harder at the primary age um, than, than the elementary train um, age. But yeah, um, so we'll put together that and send that out when we send this recording out as well. I just wanted to um, thank you for the presentation. I found it really helpful. Um, and I found myself thinking, okay, what are some ways that I can uh, really encourage my son's independence here at home? Uh, I think sometimes, you know, I go automatically into mom mode, like this needs to be done. I need to lay this out for him. But even just something as simple as he needs to make sure like his clothes are laid out for the week. Um, you know, he, he does like to fold his clothes, um, but you know, even just that kind of as a small step or little things that I do for him, like I make sure he has a water bottle, but he can make sure he has a water bottle um, to go to school. So just little things like that. I'm like, oh yeah, these are some like little small ways that I can incorporate some more of this independence in our routine. So thank you all for sparking the ideas. I'm also appreciative. I guess the only question I have is if you have any additional insights um, for those of us that are, are just coming into the model. Uh, so our son David uh, is in first grade and literally, I guess he started at, at Lee a couple of weeks ago. And um, so we're in an adjustment phase. So any additional insights that you have um, for those of us that might be in that adjustment phase would be helpful. I think I think something that comes to mind um, is sometimes being like, hey, pick out your clothes, you know, for tomorrow, like that could be overwhelming. So you can start off with something like using that example, start off with something like you pick out two outfits or something and say, hey, which one would you like to wear tomorrow? So you're kind of like limiting, as we mentioned, limiting the options or li limiting the choice that they need to make. Um, can be helpful so it doesn't feel like an overwhelming request or ask. Absolutely. I think of um, my first graders and how we scaffold so many different little steps in the classroom. Like the older students will have a, a big regular composition book for their journal. And so like an example of scaffolding would be for my first graders, I have just a little, you know, uh, eight and a half by 11, three sheets of paper folded over. So they have, you know, with primary line paper of just very simple. Okay, I'm just going to write my date and maybe the lesson I got today. And then that's success. And we celebrate this short book being finished and that being a big success. So really trying to break it down into lots of small steps. Like you can kind of ask yourself like, okay, if they were gonna pack their lunch, if that's the goal in like second or third grade, what would they need to know how to do to even get there? They might need to know like, well, what, what are, what's a healthy lunch? 
Um, is it, do I, do I just get to eat all my favorite vegetables? Because we know that's every child. <laughs> or, you know, what three things do I need to have in my lunch? Um, and then talking about maybe they get to choose a couple of those at the grocery store would be really exciting. Great. And I just want to put um, a plug in too, as thinking of this is great, especially for people that came in a little bit later is that we do have a YouTube page where we post these recordings of all of these things. So there's things from last year that were very, very pandemic specific with virtual learning. But as we start to do more of these back, back in um, regular times or late stage pandemic, as we learned today, um, we will, um, those are on there as well. And so I'll make sure you guys have the link to that. It is in the resources under parents for, I believe too. Um, and yeah, this is like, you know, we're, we really want to make sure that, um, in this time where you guys have less visibility into the school and we're coming back that we like really make sure you feel this connection that we're trying to establish as well. Okay. Leonard, this is a great question. I'm going to read it out loud for the group and then let Christina answer. If our child forgets to pack the water bottle, do we remind him or let him have a natural consequence of not having it that day? This is just an example that I'm curious about for how to encourage responsibility and independence without a lot of reminding. How many reminders, if any, should we provide? Absolutely. So we want the child to be set up for success. And so we want, I, I would in, the, in your shoes, <laughs> um, <laughs> probably ask the child or first talk with them about how it's really important to have a water bottle. Why do you think it might be important to have a water bottle at school? And so they're talking about like, well, I get thirsty and I don't want to have to ask for a cup. And, you know, um, so once you agree it's important, then you might ask them, uh, what would help you remember to bring your water bottle? Would you like a uh, a reminder, a sticky note reminder, you know, because you, and you can say, you know, I'm, I'm really busy in the morning too, getting ready for my day. So I might not remember. So how can we help you remember? Um, so it could be a little note by the door, or again, that that checklist, these are the things I need to, to put in my backpack for the day, it could be like a little laminated dry erase um, checklist where they can literally check off, do I have my water bottle? Check. Do I have my lunch? Check. Um, and then, you know, if you notice that they're forgetting to use that tool and they forget their water bottle a day or two, um, maybe circle back at the end of the week. Oh, how's your checklist working for you? Or how's that sticky note reminder we talked about? Like, oh, you know, if that's not working, what next tool would you like to try to help you remember? So we definitely want to coach them along the way. Um, and if they forget their water bottle sometimes, then, then they had the experience of how it's inconvenient to have to ask for a cup. <laughs> and sometimes it's really hard for us to find one. So, <laughs> but that's a great question. And I think it's also scaffolding, like Christina said, like if you have a child that's just coming out of primary, right. Um, we set up so many little systems for that, but, um, but we, you know, there are natural consequences. Um, and so, um, it's kind of fun identifying like what those things are too, right? And, and, and children get it right away too. All right, it is 6.40. And so we did go a little bit over an hour, but we did start a little bit late. Um, want to see if anybody else has questions in this group that you want to say out loud or put in the chat. Um, we recorded all of this, so obviously we'll send it out as well. Um, I, if you give me one second, I'm going to put the link to our YouTube page in this ch uh, chat as well so that you have that. Um, let me get that pulled up. Oh, 
All right. Um, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I would say, great. Um, and I just sent um, the link to the YouTube channel. So there's lots to stream from there as well. Um, and then if you are talking to other elementary families that want to know more about um, what's going on and, you know, how are we, how are we helping kids solve social problems and how are we getting kids back into the Montessori classrooms post pandemic, please um, encourage them to watch this recording that will be on our YouTube page shortly. Um, and Mr. Romero already asked me for our recording. So I'm sure she's getting these out tonight as well. Um, and I just want to say thank you to Christina and Mary Beth to, for your presentations tonight. These are wonderful. Um, and you guys can feel free to unmute yourself and say goodbye. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Night. Thank you. Bye.